thank you all very, very much. Um, and thank you for coming today to, uh, um, actually to honor me. I'm very honored to be here with you and to be part of the Hyundai Card uh, Super Talk 3. I'd like to express my gratitude to Hyundai Card, the exclusive publisher of Martha Stewart Living in Korea, uh, for the opportunity to share my experiences with you. Today's theme, Changing Your Life, is one that really resonates with me. Uh, my own life and my career has been marked by many uh, great changes. I grew up in the um, American town of Nutley, New Jersey. The path from my childhood home to my current position was most circuitous, marked by fits and starts, small changes and great ones. But um, all of uh, the twists and turns and detours influenced the course of my life and in turn my business. The origins of the Martha Stewart brand can be traced to my childhood home and everything I learned there. In this house, this modest house on the fifth of an acre, um, there were six children, three bedrooms, one bathroom, and mother and dad. No pets. No pets had, there was no room for any pets. Like most Catholics in those days, um, I grew up in that large family. Uh, there were three brothers and two sisters. I was second oldest to my brother, Eric. I developed a passion for cooking uh, from my mother. She prepared the European style recipes that she learned from her own parents uh, who had emigrated to America from Poland. Uh, my grandfather was a steel worker. He did decorative steel work. Uh, hammering with his giant hands, uh, beautiful iron, wrought iron for the churches in Buffalo, New York. And uh, I remember uh, him being honored when he was 95 years old by uh, the iron workers, uh, the decorative iron workers union. Uh, and we all went to uh, see him get his honor at 95 years old. And you would never shake my grandfather's hand because you were so afraid he would break your hand with his strength. <laughs> Uh, she also taught me how to sew. I found that I enjoyed making things by hand and developed a love of crafting. My father introduced me to the pleasures of gardening. We had only a fifth of an acre, as I just said, but with six kids to feed, not an inch of that fifth of an acre went to waste. Uh, Dad grew four pound tomatoes. He uh, grew wonderful cucumbers. He grew um, all the essentials for my mom to uh, can and to freeze. And, uh, and we ate very, very well. Our table had at least six vegetables on it at every meal. Dad also passed along to me his passion for photography. He gave me my first camera via Santa at age eight. To this day, I'm never without a camera. In fact, with me on this trip, I have four cameras. I also got lots of early experience in front of the camera. The first job I had outside of babysitting for my neighbors was as a model, which helped pay for my college education. And here you see two of the early pictures of me as a model. Um, and um, it was, uh, I, I had a great deal of fun learning how to pose, how to do makeup and hair, and actually how to gain a lot of self-confidence. In my sophomore year of college, which I was paying for uh, with my earnings uh, from modeling, um, I married Andy Stewart. Uh, Andy was a law student at Yale Law School, uh, having graduated uh, from University of Virginia. I was a student at Barnard College in New York City. It's a very difficult college to get into, very hard to uh, stay in, and you have to study very, very hard uh, and be a good student. Uh, it's a great place. Uh, right after college, I was uh, intrigued by Wall Street. My father-in-law was a stockbroker. He encouraged me to go into um, business on Wall Street. He said, be a stockbroker. You'll learn a lot, and uh, you'll probably make a lot of money. So I interviewed many of the big firms in New York City. I remember interviewing Merrill Lynch. They had a great training program. 
Uh, but I thought, oh, this is so big. It's just like any old corporation. So I didn't go to Merrill Lynch. Um, and then I, inter I interviewed some very fancy schmancy firm, Auchincloss Parker and Redpath. And I thought, oh, this is too fancy schmancy. And then I met um, Andy Moness. He's the second from the left there with the mustache. And, uh, and, he, uh, and he actually encouraged me to join his small little, we, they call them go-go firms in those days, to uh, a little research firm called Moness, Williams, and Seidel. And I learned a lot. I, it was like putting your feet to the fire and being pushed out the door by, by mom all at the same time, um, learning how to uh, uh, analyze a company, sell a company, um, persuade your clients, and I had very difficult clients. Manufacturers Hanover Trust was my big client. Uh, University of Rochester, um, big client. Rockefeller Brothers Fund, the Ford Foundation. Uh, these were all clients that none of my partners had been able to break. Uh, they sent me out and luckily I was able to get their business. Um, and we had a lot of fun. We also went to Washington. We became very political. Um, being a stockbroker, you could be political. Being a magazine editor, as I am now, I have to be quite apolitical. If I say anything about any candidate, I lose subscribers. And it's a difficult position because you want to be able to be honest with your readers, but you cannot <laughs> talk about certain things, politics among them. But there I am with, uh, some of those guys are pretty, pretty famous, actually. Right behind me is Vance Hartke, uh, and over on the right is Hubert Humphrey, who ran for president, who was a vice president. And, uh, and the guy with the beard is um, uh, Frank Williams, who was one of the most brilliant, and still is, one of the most brilliant analysts on Wall Street. Uh, he was the first one to uh, discover a man called Ross Perot of Electronic Data Systems and we bought that stock. He was the first to recommend the purchase of McDonald's, that little tiny fast food business, and uh, a lot of other interesting companies. And um, there, but my love for cooking and crafts and gardening never faded. I was a working woman, so I had to be organized. Uh, I made my sauce bases on Tuesday, made my desserts on Wednesday, and then I entertained my business clients on Thursday, always at home, big dinner parties, uh, borrowed the silver, went, drove to Nutley, New Jersey, where my mom lived, borrowed her silver and brought it home, went to my, my mother-in-law's down on Park Avenue and borrowed her glasses so I could pour the wine. Uh, but uh, we entertained, I painted, this is me painting my kitchen on uh, uh, 290 Riverside Drive, one of our, our first big apartment. But uh, being in the city didn't stop me from gardening. Our kitchen was crowded with overgrown herb plants and I raised orchids in the bathtubs. Two years into our marriage, our apartment became even more crowded, uh, not only with cat Chiggy Toto, but I gave birth to uh, my daughter Alexis. And there she is. Um, I don't know what I'm feeding her, something out of a cup. <laughs> I wonder, but a um, very healthy baby gr has grown into um, a mother herself. Eventually, Andy and I decided to move to the country on a Sunday afternoon in February 1970. We drove through Connecticut when some friends told us about the haunted house of Turkey Hill. Now, in those days, everything was so inexpensive. This house cost, I think, $29,000, something like that. Um, when I sold it, I sold it for eight and a half million dollars. That was a pretty good investment. Um, but to say that was a fixer upper, well, it was an understatement. After being rented out for 50 years, it had no garage, no barn, just a rickety picket fence and an unkempt yard. There was not much of a kitchen, no usable bathrooms, no porch, no terrace, uh, no garden, and actually a very poor driveway. But it had good bones. It was an 1805 American farmhouse, and I fell in love. And uh, it was actually really the reason that I became Martha Stewart. The restoration and expansion of Turkey Hill was an enormous undertaking and a real education in home improvement. Uh, it was also the beginning of what evolved into my life's work and the business that bears my name. I painted, oh, and there's my daughter, Alexis. She's, I think, six years old. Uh, we thought nothing of putting her up on an extension ladder and having her paint the house. I mean, six years old, most people would think, oh gosh, you're gonna try to kill your child. 
But uh, she was she was very anxious to go up there and paint. She helped me. We painted our way through Watergate, and listening to it on the radio, and uh, and uh, doing all kinds of work. I had to uh, make up in housework what I had lost leaving Wall Street. I I left Wall Street to become a mother, and really pay attention to my daughter, and also start my catering business. I had always loved to cook and enjoyed experimenting in the kitchen, and I began making pies and selling them at a local market. Clients came in droves. I took a chance and placed a single ad in the local uh, papers offering my services as a caterer, and I called myself the Uncatered Affair. Uh, but here I am in my kitchen. You can see everything you see I grew in my garden. Um, everything that's on the table, I cooked myself. I had no help whatsoever, and I was a fool. I just thought, oh my gosh, catering, I can do that. But it was like building a restaurant every night, um, cooking for it, and then breaking it down. It was very, very hard work. Uh, the first big job I had was a wedding for 300 people. It was 108 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and it was uh, just absolutely horrible. But the wedding was a huge success, and everything, the food tasted really good, and uh, I was on my way. Uh, from that event forward, I knew I had found the job that had been waiting for me, and I soon learned that when you really love what you do, it's much more than just work. I worked incredibly hard to set myself apart from other caterers. My parties um, had to um, look different, taste different, and deliver a whole new experience than other parties. Nothing was too much effort. Here I am. I had just visited Japan, my first visit, and I went to an, a fantastic, um, a su a fantastic tempura restaurant called Tenmasa. He had cooked for the emperor, and he told us the whole story, and I got his secret recipe for tempura, and of course I came home and made tempura. That was actually pretty good. And uh, I still make tempura. I love it. Uh, but in those days, that's what I served to, um, who knows, probably 100 guests one night at somebody's house. And I attracted higher profile clients as a result. In the process of my growing catering business, it occurred to me that there was a passion I enjoyed even more than baking and cooking and entertaining. Um, and it was teaching. Here I am with my daughter Alexis and her 10-year-old classmates, teaching them the basics of pot brise, crepes, souffles, and other great classics. Alexis is third from the right, the tallest girl. She's still the tallest girl. I began to contribute articles to magazines and then became a food editor. I could see that my clients wished they had a book to help them think through the elements of entertaining. I wanted that book. And one thing that I did all throughout my career is when I saw a void, when I saw an empty place, I tried to fill it. And that book, that first book, Entertaining, uh, was very hard for me to write. I didn't know how to write a book. I had never written a book. Um, but, and there was no single book that showed you how to cook, entertain, and gave you all the great recipes that you would need to have a party. Um, and in 1982, that book was published. My, publi my publishers said, oh, we'll print 25,000 copies. And I said, well, you better print more. I know, I know like a million people who need this book. And they laughed at me, and it has sold way more than a million copies. Other books followed, books on weddings, books on gardening, uh, on pies and tarts, on hors d'oeuvres, restoring old houses, and of course, holidays, Christmas in particular. My home and gardens became a laboratory for all of our ideas. I was working with a team at this point, many of whom are still with me today, and the brand began to grow. Then in the, 19, in the early 90s, I thought, why limit this to books? Why couldn't we publish a magazine that would draw upon our core of experts in so many fields to teach, inspire, and instruct uh, in the very same way? And my team and I decided on a July theme, and uh, we compiled a prototype to attract investors. I uh, showed the book first to Cy Newhouse, who was the head of Condé Nast. He paid for the prototype. He loved it. And when he asked me what I would call it, I said, oh, Martha Stewart. And he said, we cannot call it Martha Stewart. This is Condé Nast. And he said, maybe you better try to find somebody else. 
So and he's he's still a friend. I didn't get too mad at him. Um, and then I took it to Rupert Murdoch, and Rupert said, "Oh, I'd love to do this magazine. It's so interesting. But I think uh, I'm selling all my magazines, so maybe you should take it to Time Warner." So I took it to Time, and they actually uh, loved it and uh, partnered with me to publish Martha Stewart Living. Uh, learning to be a successful entrepreneur means believing in your idea, fighting for it, even when others can't see it. Uh, and Time Warner, um, the leading me media company, uh, really um, went uh, full force ahead with me on this magazine. And within a couple years, we had broken even and were on our way to profitability. Uh, it debuted in the late fall of 1990 and was an instant success. This year, we are celebrating our 20th anniversary with more than 11 million readers. And um, we are so very excited about the foreign editions that are being published around the world. Uh, and we're very excited about our Korean edition. Um, uh, let me say to all of you here today who wonder if 40 or 45 or 50 years old is too late to begin a new career and succeed, um, is crazy. Well, it, it isn't. I was 40 years old when I wrote Entertaining. I was 50 years old when we launched our first magazine, Martha Stewart Living. And uh, it has been an extraordinary learning experience for me, an extraordinary financial success, and a, a really, really great result for all of our readers our, and our viewers and, and the rest of the people who support our company. I think the age of 40 or 50 can be a great time to start a new career. You know who you are, you certainly know what you want, and your passions uh, and what your passions are, and you can um, have a sense of urgency about your life and your career. Creativity just isn't about having ideas. It's about having the inner will to do the work that it takes to bring uh, all those ideas to fruition. And I'm proud to be a late bloomer. That's what my doctor called me. He said, Martha, you're a late bloomer. And uh, I smiled and laughed and, uh, and agreed with him. Um, it's better to be a late bloomer than never to bloom at all, isn't it? After the magazine debuted, I began appearing, uh, appearing on television more and more, um, and um, we decided to do our own show. In 1993, we launched Martha Stewart Living Television, a weekly half-hour program uh, that quickly moved to an hour program. And uh, the TV show was a lot of fun. It was also a very effective way to drive viewers to the magazine. A lot of people told me, oh, this television show will cannibalize the magazine. People won't buy the magazine if you have a television show. Well, it turned to be out to be just the opposite. It was very, very important to synergize, to synergize all the work we were doing in one business with another very different business. There are different viewers and different readers. At this point, I was truly living my passion. Uh, my staff and I created a large and growing library of real content with a huge potential for that synergy with other media platforms. If we could combine all those elements into one omnimedia company, the whole would be greater, I thought, than the sum of its parts. And this is our original business plan. <laughs> it still looks kind of silly, uh, but it still is a true business plan. Martha Stewart in the middle, uh, those are our core content areas of interest, and uh, from there emanate the omnimedia, the omnimerchandising, and the internet direct commerce. It works, and it has worked, and other, um, other media companies have now have, have and are now trying to emulate just this business plan. Um, and then I decided, well, I, uh, to realize this, this vision, um, I decided I had to buy the company back from time. Um, it wasn't easy coming up with the financing. And I went to one banker who said, oh, yeah, this is a great idea. Let's, let's do it, 70-30. And I thought, oh, that sounds good. And I said, 70? And he said, yes, we'll own 70, you'll own 30. And... Uh, uh, he was a famous banker. I won't tell you his name, but I got up and I said, oh, excuse me, I think I'm going to go and throw up. <laughs> and, uh, and I left the room not, never to go back. Um, and I finally just signed on the dotted line myself. Um, and um, in 1997, we bought the company back from Time, Inc. 
and the business continued to prosper and expand, and two years later, we took the company public. It was very, very exciting. Uh, and on that day, um, uh, it was a fabulous day going public. Um, when I drove up Madison Avenue, I thought, oh my gosh, I could buy anything on this street. Um, unfortunately, I didn't. <laughs> Today, Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia is a media and merchandising business. We reach 37 million passionately engaged readers, viewers, users, and listeners every month with our magazines, our books, our radio and television shows, and all our digital properties. Our audience is primarily in the United States, but we're expanding internationally, and we have um, lots of uh, international editions of our, of, of our various magazines. Our TV programming airs in more than 70 countries, from Australia to Yemen. We also have a growing merchandise business. We offer Martha Stewart branded products for the home at Macy's. Beautiful, beautiful products for the home. Um, several hundred million dollars worth of products. And also we have a thriving business at a very large mass market retailer in America called The Home Depot. And The Home Depot, we have outdoor furniture, uh, garden thing, things for the garden. We have beautiful kitchens. We have wonderful floor coverings and a very uh, extensive line of paints. Uh, we have lots of decorative items too, like draperies and curtain rods. And it, it will be an ever-expanding uh, business. We do all the designing of the products in-house, uh, the Home Depot and Macy's, uh, do the manufacturing and, uh, the, um, um, and the merchandising of, of all the products. We also have a very innovative crafts product line, and here in Korea we are selling um, lots of those products. We've sold more than 3 million punches uh, and more than 7 million bottles of, or 176 tons of our various glitters. Um, it's quite astonishing. And we also offer wonderful products for pets through PetSmart. We have leashes and bowls and beds and coats and jackets for your dogs. And we're just about to launch our cat products uh, for the kitties. I have three dogs myself and five cats. And um, we're also going to be doing things for pet birds. I have lots of birds, 27 of them, and two on their way. We have two, two I left two eggs in the nest and um, horses and sheep, and I don't know what we can do at PetSmart with those. Many of our products are inspired by my own homes and all that they um, encompass. Uh, on the upper left is my lily pond house, which has inspired many of our home designs for KB Home, uh, one of America's largest home builders. And we have found that in recent years with the economic uh, downturn that um, our homes have gotten smaller. Um, and people want smaller houses. They don't want the six bedrooms. Uh, they might want four bedrooms still, but in a much smaller footprint. And we have designed beautiful, uh, economical, excellent homes uh, for uh, the growing family, uh, but they are affordable and they are the right size. And because of the downsizing of the American home, we're also, we also design furniture and always have furniture that is proportionate and in, in good um, keeping with the size of the average home rather than the big McMansions. We want consumers to join us in celebrating the art of creative living in every single day. It's very, very important uh, for us to um, uh, think that way and for us to uh, try to help our consumers believe that way. So you can see that my life, um, the way that I live, um, has had a great influence on Martha Stewart, the brand. And uh, I'm very proud of that. I still, um, still do the daily chores. I still clean out the chicken coop. I still do a lot of the gardening. I still um, do a lot of the weeding and the, and the designing and the thinking about all the various products that make up the Martha Stewart brand. But um, it's still fun, it's still a vibrant business, and it's ever growing and ever interesting. And uh, I can't tell you how excited I am to be here um, to um, tell you about what's going on. We have another um, half hour uh, to talk some more, uh, but right now we'll take a break. Thank you. <laughs>